Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you today? I am doing so well today. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing pretty well, Lance. I'm just getting over my winter cold. But we are here today with one of my favorite guests all time, I'd have to say. She's just such a great person. I know, right? I mean, right from when we first met her, just uh, through Bill Thomas over email, she just seemed like such a cool person. Uh, it is the one and only Gemma Hoskins, who most people know from the Netflix series The Keepers. And she also has a podcast called Out of the Shadows, which she does with investigative journalist Shane Waters. Yeah, it's a great podcast. And Gemma is definitely a great person to talk to about what she's uncovering and what she and and the rest of the crew uncovered in the keepers and if you haven't seen the keepers on netflix what are you doing um it is amazing and it is terrifying and uh it's suspenseful and it's just it's one of those stories that keeps getting bigger and bigger and now by the time we talk to Gemma um on crawlspace here for this episode it's like the story has gotten even bigger than it was on the keepers right isn't that incredible like the keepers is so good it revolves around the murder of sister Catherine sesnick in 1970 and uh, this was a 26 year old nun she was an english teacher at archbishop keogh high school in baltimore and while the netflix series is excellent we start hearing all of these developments from Gemma, and it's sort of a bit like that cliche where how how high does it go like at what level does this stop and it's it's fascinating to hear what is driving Gemma. we're talking about like we're talking about organizations that should really terrify people that don't seem to terrify Gemma. Well, I think she's a little bit guarded, but I think mostly she's motivated because Sister Kathy Sesnick was her teacher, was her favorite teacher when she went to that very high school, um, that, that Catholic school in Baltimore. So I think that's where a lot of Gemma's motivation comes from. And it's amazing how passionate she is and how she has not let this go. Yeah. And there's a lot of moments in this interview where it is a little bit uncomfortable, but for the most part, Gemma does come across as just a total badass. But uh, yeah, stick with it. It is a great interview. Like you said, one of one of our favorite guests. Okay, everybody. So I hope you enjoy the interview with Gemma Hoskins. Follow her on social media and check out their podcast, Out of the Shadows. There are links in the show notes. Gemma Hoskins, welcome to Crawl Space. How are you today? Thank you. I'm great. Um... As I told you before, I'm sitting in my bathroom with two doors closed between me and my dog because Teddy <laughs> likes to be involved in everything I'm doing. So if I were sitting near him, he'd be taking my shoes off and barking. So we're not going to have that. What, what if only one door was separating you two? Oh, no, he would be outside the bathroom door barking. He's a celebrity dog. What can I say? That's right. You're in a lot of pictures with him, I've noticed. Yep. And we are a dog friendly show, just to let you know if uh, okay. if he does uh, want to join in, we will happily uh, welcome that he can probably contribute more and be a little more articulate than me. So, uh, so. That, no, that, that's OK. We'll just pass on Teddy today. Well, send, send our <laughs> regards to Teddy. And and by the by the way, Gemma, we've had a number of people on. Thank you for joining us and taking your time out of your day and locking yourself in your bathroom. We've had a number Absolutely. of uh, people on on Crawl Space that Tim and I get a little intimidated by because they're such badasses, and you are in the top five of badass guests oh, that we've ever had. Uh, well, badass is good, but I don't want to intimidate anybody. Well, too late. Well, it's just natural. It's okay. It's no, I have a big personality, I know, and I don't like people to feel like I'm not approachable. I would say we do it to ourselves to some degree, and um, and you you have never come off as not approachable to us. We uh we had a phone call with you earlier this year, and um just had a great call. You know, it was just a lot of fun talking to you. And obviously, we've seen you on Netflix's show, The Keepers, and we've heard you on Out of the Shadows, and we know that you've got a um a great personality. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I've been called a bulldog by Tom Nugent. Didn't like that one. Uh, our director said I was brash. I'm not sure that has a positive connotation, but badass is fine with me. Yeah, I, I take uh, <laughs> t I take all of those as compliments. Uh, 
a bulldog brash. Like if you're investigating something and your and your reputation mm-hmm. for being a bulldog precedes you in a, in an investigation, if you're interviewing somebody, go with it. Yeah, the only ones I'm concerned about intimidating are, is the um, institutional Catholic Church. Yikes! Right. I'm serious about that. I, yes, and my yikes was yeah. serious too. Okay. Yeah, it's quite a a mystery you've um you've delved into, and uh, it's got some wide ranging implications, doesn't it? Well, I just remarked to someone today that it keeps getting wider and wider. And now it looks like there was an entire network that involved clergy, police officers, very high ranking politicians, very, very high ranking in Baltimore, and a lot of thugs who would take money to do their dirty work for them. So, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, most of those people are dead. And I think the more public I am, the safer I am. But it was an incredible network of pedophilia and prostitution. Okay, so before we get into where it's all uh, blossomed, how it's all blossomed uh, in into, what, what it's blossomed into, I mean, I just want to back up a little bit for anybody who has not seen The Keepers. It's a seven-part uh, docu-series produced by Netflix, uh, so check that out. And it delves into the unsolved murder of sister Kathy Sesnick, and she was an English and drama teacher at Baltimore's Archbishop Keogh High School, and you were a primary figure in all of this, and you, you, uh, that translated to your involvement with the Keepers and your continued investigation. Can you just take us back to uh, your time um, and your experience with, uh, with the case of uh, Kathy Sesnick? Certainly. Um, Kathy was my teacher. When I was at Archbishop Keogh, I had her for English and I was in the drama club for several years. And she's really the reason I became a teacher because she was had really high standards for us. And the harder we work, the higher the standards went. And we thrived on that. So um, of all the teachers from my, you know, my years in school, including college, She's really the most outstanding one, and she she used strategies that that are timeless. One was called the Socratic method, and for those of your listeners who are not familiar with that, she really used like a question and answer kind of strategy where she would encourage us to give reasons for our answers and probe us by saying, well, why and how do you know and what makes you think that? So there were never just yes and no answers in her classroom. And we all thrived. We all loved her. She, This sounds so corny, but she really was like Julie Andrews. I mean, she was artistic. She played musical instruments. She could sing. She could dance. She did. She directed a number of musicals that I was fortunate enough to to um, make the cast. And it was just a highlight of my of my you know, schooling all my life. And then she left at the end of my junior year to live out in the, in the community. Um, she did not give up her vows as a nun at that time, but this was kind of an experiment. She and another lovely nun who was also very young. Uh, Kathy was only 26 when she was murdered. So when you think about you know, I don't know where I was at 26. I certainly wasn't real mature. Well, maybe I was, I don't know, but I don't think I could have handled my students coming to me, telling me that they had been abused, but she was living in an apartment not far from Keogh with another nun, and they both were teaching in public schools. And in November of her year teaching at Western High School, which is a girls' school in Baltimore City, she disappeared in November, and we were all in shock. Her body was found two months later, a couple miles away, and the murder's never been solved. So about six years ago, uh, Abby Fitzgerald and I started poking around. Now, Abby and I, we knew each other at Keo, but this is kind of funny. I was at the bottom of the top class because they had to have a couple, like, not perfect uh, students to tutor. 
So Abby had to tutor me in math and she got credit for doing that. I just had to show up. <laughs> wow. So we knew each other. Yeah, we knew each other, but we had gone our separate ways. And when Tom Nugent wrote his, his story called Who Killed Sister Kathy, I started corresponding with Tom and what evolved from that was a Facebook page for Keogh alumni who um, either were survivors of Joseph Maskell, who was the chaplain, or who were their supporters. And so Abby and I both ended up on that page. And then from that grew a public Facebook page that was called Justice for Catherine Sesnick and Joyce Malecki. Joyce was another young woman who lived um, in the same community, was older than the rest of us. She was not in, at Keogh, but she was murdered four days after Kathy was just disappeared. So we've always felt like the two were, were connected. So the last six years, um, I've been digging. And so about a year and a half into our own grassroots investigation, which was really all online and by phone with other people, the uh, filmmakers, Tripod Media, found me. And Ryan White, who is now such an accomplished a documentary director and his best friend, Jessica Hargrave, who is the executive producer, they had an article from Ryan's aunt, who was one of Kathy's students. A lot of people don't know that. His aunt uh, was at Keogh. She sent him an article about Kathy, probably the one that Tom wrote, and he talked to her, and they decided to see if they could meet with Jean. Jean Wayner is Jane Doe. And they flew out. I didn't know this, but they flew out to uh, meet with Jean several times before they reached out to any of us. And it wasn't until Jean was completely comfortable with the camera and actually showing her face and telling her story that they reached out to the rest of us. So... In November of, I think it was 2000, probably 13, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, I got a call from their producer, Jessica, who's now a dear friend, and we talked for a couple hours. I really felt good about, about where they were going with this. They were very wise beyond their years. They were very respectful. This was not going to be like a cheese and crackers kind of, you know, uh, salacious movie the the story is sensational enough and they were approaching right. it from a really respectful um perspective honoring those who had been impacted and trying to help us find out what happened so that was the beginning of three years of working with them and they flew back and forth between la and baltimore every month for a week or 10 days and filmed what was already going on and if Abby and I were going to do something that we could wait for example go to the archives or knock on doors we would wait for them and then they would go with us uh, the director of photography is a Balmorian his name is John Benham and he was their primary camera person and actually they're all at Sundance as we speak because tripod media ryan jessica and john are premiering a new documentary that they've just completed called assassins and that one is the story of the murder of kim jong nam oh yeah yeah the two women who were charged with that so th that's a new documentary and they have another one coming out called visible out on television and they have five one-hour episodes. I think it's on Apple TV. And that will come out in February. And they've interviewed all kinds, all like a wide variety of individuals from the LGBTQ community who have come out on TV. For example, Ellen DeGeneres, Anderson Cooper, Don Lemon people that we're all familiar with are going to tell their story and what it's been like. So they have a lot of 
you know, a real wide variety of, of documentaries that are coming out this year. That's very, and, that, and that's Tripod? That's tripod Media? Tripod Media, yes. They've moved into a new office in L.A., and I think um, things are going really well for them. I'm so proud that, you know, we're like a family after after working on this film. It was it was difficult at times, but we all got through yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, that's amazing. Well, yeah, that's that's great that you've been able to um, make some friendships too uh, through through your involvement in um, in the keepers and uh, obviously into this into looking into the case. Um, you've you've made some friends too and reconnected with Abby. So, can you tell us a little bit about Jean's story? Sure. Jean is a very private person. It took her a long time before she presented herself as Jane Doe um, until I got involved in the docu-series. We didn't know who Jane Doe was. We know about Jane Doe and Jane Roe, but Jean kind of came out on the Keo page and said, I'm, I'm Jean Wainer, Jean Harded on Wainer, and this is what happened to me. Jean is quite it's a it's hard to describe her she reminds me a lot of kathy she's almost ethereal she's so um, just something about her is just really special and her story is that she was abused by joseph maskell at keo for quite a while and other individuals were involved in the abuse she does feel like she was subjected to drugs and hypnosis. And um, we do a couple podcast episodes with her where we have also interviewed an expert in MK Ultra. And your listeners will have to look that up. But we think that Maskell had connections and was using the same mind control strategies that were used in the CIA project. We know that the Hopkins was involved in that and he had connections at Hopkins. We know that some of the army bases were connected and he was certainly involved at the army bases because he was a chaplain everywhere. So um, Jean has really come to a place where she believes that she was subjected to the same kinds of mind control. And she has shared on our podcast uh, what she believes happened to her in his office and it's just a horror story that she was brutally abused and assaulted by not only Maskell but other men some in uniforms who were present there she has even talked about in her appellate court summary about the involvement of some of the male teachers in the building. So she went to Sister Kathy. And actually, I think Kathy found her in the hall one day, just kind of looking dazed. And by the way, the woman in the keepers with the long hair that's walking down the hall and portrays Jean, that is not Jean. And that is not the inside of Keo. We were not permitted to go in there and film, of course. Really? That's surprising. Oh no. <laughs> are you being are you being sarcastic? Yes, yes, okay. sorry. All right. <laughs> anyway, so they had to use a school in Los Angeles and they used the descriptions that a lot of us gave them of the classrooms and the hallways to find a place that would look similar and could be set up that way. But anyway, Jean, I think, was subjected to hypnosis so that when the door locked behind her after leaving that office, she would not remember a lot of what happened in there for a very long time. And Sister Kathy saw her in the hall one day, kind of looking clueless, and said, are you okay? And so they talked, and Kathy understood that something was wrong and that Jean was being subjected. I think Kathy suspected this, that Jean was being subjected to abuse 
And we know of at least two other girls who are women now, both living, who also told Kathy what was going on. So when Kathy decided to leave Keo, you know, there's a lot of stories about why. One was that she and her friend, Sister Russell, wanted to live out in the community. I always felt in my gut that perhaps they left because of what was happening in the school and that the faculty knew about it. I've tried to reach out to the faculty that was there when I was, and I have not had much luck. I either can't find them or they won't talk to me. There were several nuns that were involved in the abuse, and they're both living. And, of course, their superiors have told them not to talk to anybody. Anyway, I've done everything I can. The police have tried to talk to them, and they they won't do it. So right now, our attorney general is conducting a criminal investigation into clergy abuse in Maryland. And I imagine that if the attorney general convenes a grand jury like Pennsylvania did with Josh Shapiro, that those nuns will be subpoenaed. But I think they can take the Fifth Amendment and still not have to talk. I don't know if I'm correct, but I think that's the way it works. So from there, Jean finished Keo. I think she felt like when she came back in the fall and Kathy was gone because Kathy had left over the summer, she told me that she was angry because Kathy said she would take care of it and Kathy wasn't there. I think the other girls felt the same way. So Maskell came to her and said, I uh, hear you've been saying bad things about me. Now, Joseph Maskell was the chaplain who was the primary abuser, quite a, a psychopath, I think. And he said to her, you know, not nice to say bad things about me. And she said the abuse became worse. So when Kathy disappeared, he came to Jean and said he knew where Kathy was. And she got all excited. And one day after school, after Kathy had disappeared, he put her in the car. She was anxious to see her teacher. And he unfortunately took her to see Kathy's body. Oh, God. Yeah. And that was a few weeks after Kathy disappeared. Jean has talked about it. And I find her very credible. So um, when she went, was taken to see Kathy's body, Maskell said to her, this is what happens to people who say bad things about me. That's like a line that I'm never going to forget because she says that's exactly what he said. And when Jean saw Kathy, she said there were live maggots on her face and she was trying to brush them off and saying, help me, help me. And he just, he didn't. And then I was able to read the autopsy Kathy's family gave me a copy of it and there were Werner Spitz who's very famous he was a medical examiner there were maggots in her throat trachea and esophagus now she was found in January of 1970 so she had been out in the weather for two months when Jean found her, November was warm. And for people who have seen the keepers, there's a scene where I'm looking at the temperatures going up into the 60s. And this is a little hard for me to talk about because she was my teacher, but it's going to be hard for your listeners to hear. But when it gets warm, ma um, maggots are very active. And when it gets cold, they burrow deeper into whatever organic material they're in. So when Kathy was found, there was no evidence of maggots on her face. But during the autopsy, they were found inside because they had gone inside her organs. You may remember a scene in The Keepers where James Scannell, the lieutenant who was one of the first on the scene that day, he was also very good friends with Maskell. He's the guy I said, if I give you a crab cake, if I buy you a crab cake, will you please 
you know, get the mis- get the documents for us. And a lot of people caught me looking a little doubtful into the camera. But his comment that day when we met him, out of the blue, he said, I mean, there were no maggots or anything. And this was, we had never even brought this up. So he's deceased. And I feel comfortable saying that he's been, he was recognized in the keepers by several women who were triggered when they saw him because he was also their abuser. So he was involved. Yeah, he was involved with Edgar Davidson, who's the guy who had all the weird stuffed animals in his apartment, who the I couldn't believe the filmmakers actually got in there to talk to him. And he was tight with Joseph Maskell. So this is all firsthand information. It's all credible and it all adds up to a really huge network. Unfortunately, this may be things the police already know, but because this is still an active cold case, they can't share anything with me. And believe me, I'm a pest. No. (laughs) I just sent like eight questions to the officer who is in charge of this of this uh, investigation, Mm -hmm. because sometimes I feel like like I've helped them. You know, Robin Teal was the corporal who was. Um, in charge of the cold case she's in homicide now but she still has her hands in this one and she's asked me because I I have a lot of I have a big audience now and if we need to find somebody I can put it out there on the couple of Facebook pages that involve the keepers and we usually get the answer within 24 hours so she asked me about a name that sounded familiar to me but I couldn't place the person so I put it out on um, the Keo survivors page, and within a couple of hours, I got back who the person was, where they lived, what their involvement was. So I just turn it back into her. So I give them a lot of information, but it all goes one way. They can't tell me anything. You had said uh, earlier on, and I and I want to make sure I don't forget to ask this. Did you say that Joseph Maskell was part of Project MK Ultra? We don't think that he was a formal part of it. We know that he applied for a grant at Hopkins. Uh He was brilliant. He was brilliant. And I've learned so much about, unfortunately, about psychopaths. He was very gregarious. He had like two sides to him. But the psychopath side is, is just totally narcissistic, focused on himself. And we know that he applied for a grant did not get it but we also know that and this is in one of our podcast episodes there was a gynecologist his name was christian richter that maskell took keo girls to your guess is as good as mine about why he took them there i've talked to the uh one of the medical technicians that worked for richter and she told me that in one of his offices he had a whole suite of offices below the regular office that were only accessible by one staircase and that men, she thinks businessmen, and a priest used to bring girls there a lot. The uh, technicians were told to stay out. The doors were locked. Sometime there would be a bunch of men down there with him. Who knows what was going on? But the girls would come back up the steps, groggy, and she said she she told the office manager about this, and the office manager told her to keep her mouth shut. So I believe that Maskell was always concerned about whether somebody got pregnant by him, and I think that a lot of illegal abortions happened in that office. In fact, I know they did because some girls remember it. And I also believe that he was also having anybody that uh, was being sexually abused constantly checked to see if they were pregnant. And I've heard stories from more than one woman that, uh, and I'll get to the MK Ultra part, this is all connected, um, from one woman that while Richter was doing a pelvic examination, Maskell is fondling her 
and Richter is raping her. Oh, my God. So talk to a woman who was taken to see Richter when she was seven and doesn't remember what happened to her there, but her parents were not in the room. And I don't know if you guys have girlfriends or wives, but that ain't allowed. There always has to be an assistant in the room. Yeah. We were contacted by a woman who saw the keepers and who actually recognized Christian Richter because there's a short news clip in there of him and a photograph. And she got in touch with me and said he trafficked her in the MK Ultra program. And I was like, what? So I talked to her. She's very credible. We have had her therapist. Sex abuse therapist is a real specialty. It's not like, you know, you go to your family doctor or your counselor. This is something that because um, dissociative disorder, which means like your head goes someplace else when you're having Mm. trauma, is very common in abuse victims. And so when they're it, while they're literally being raped or abused, they put themselves someplace else to get through it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. They dissociate from their own personality, and they may develop multiple personalities depending on what the situation is. So she told me that she saw him, and she shared with us that he took her to several this is going to sound crazy and half the people listening aren't going to believe this but i've wrapped my head around this for a year and i do believe it took her to nasa facilities and hospitals where mind control experiments were being done now people can look at an, a website called the black vault the ault it's an app and see remaining documents from the MK Ultra program, when people began to find out that a lot of the stuff going on was illicit, it was, you know, the CIA, everything disappeared. You don't mess with the CIA, and it was a CIA project. So because Maskell was connected with Richter and this woman who is very intelligent, she's professional, she's an artist, she told us that he would take her to what would look like a medical theater like you'd see on television where you know students and doctors are watching an operation but she said there were politicians there were businessmen there were scientists doctors and she was a child she said from the time she was like six until 14 this would happen her parents were part of it they were paid for her to be used this way And she said that Richter invented a box that was like a portable electrode box that would measure brain waves. And she described it to me. And when I spoke with the medical technician that had worked in Richter's regular GYN practice, she said, I've seen that box. And I didn't tell her much about it. I asked her to describe it. It was exactly the same description. And like size, shape, everything. She said it was on a shelf behind Richter's desk in the basement suite of offices and that they were all told not to touch it. She thought it was like an antique radio, but it wasn't. It was this box that would measure electrodes. So we know that Richter was part of MK Ultra program. We also know... There was a doctor who died last year. His name is Paul McHugh, and he invented what he called the false memory syndrome. And he testified in the Doe Row hearings for the church that these women were having false memories and that they were subject to suggestion and that what they're th- you know, what they're saying happened never happened. Well, he was a contractor for MK Ultra at Hopkins. He was part of the program. So I dig constantly. I spend a good part of every day talking to other people, talking to people like you. Like, hopefully your listeners will 
they could they know how to reach me i have a very private facebook page but if they want to private message me or do it through you i'm always listening and some of them are quacks i've been threatened all that stuff but um somebody will know something and so i just want more information so yeah we we believe that several of the girls were involved with the mk ultra theories maskell gave personality and psychological tests to these women that he was not authorized to do but there was a psychiatrist that worked part-time william urban who died last year who had access to these kinds of uh, psychiatric tests and so maskell would administer these and find out like there were questions like are you easily influenced have you ever been hypnotized? Like weird questions. You may have heard about everything's connected. The cemetery dig where the, where the cops dug up, you know, truckloads of documents. We believe all those tests were in that hole. And we believe all the evidence that we would ever need to prove that Maskell did this was in that hole. And it's all disappeared. Oh my gosh. It's all disappeared. Wow. Yeah. We've heard that it was in an evidence room that got flooded well, they always get flooded, don't they? Yeah. How about that? Why do they put those places in the basement? But we've also heard that the stuff was moved to shipping containers. And I think a shipping container is like a truck body, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. OK. Um, at Fort Detrick, which is an army base. Hello. The stuff's all out there. And if I disappear, you guys will know probably who did it. Jesus, Jeez. what are you what are you uncovering here? I mean, you had you had said earlier that it Bigger goes than, yeah, yeah more than more than and and there's a lot I can't tell you because it's confidential and it's been shared by survivors, by retired police officers, by um, you know people who are 90 years old and have really good memories. We even have been able to contact and talk to the hunter that found Sister Kathy. And we did an episode with him. I hope that your listeners will jump on out of the shadows because all 40 plus episodes have new information from new people. So it's going to take, we've been doing it for about a year and a half and we still have more to go. Um, We're uncovering unbelievable stuff that, is pretty scary and was never meant to be uncovered. And I guess I'm naive, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm I, I'm um, releasing a book this summer. Oh, excellent! Yeah, believe it or not, the title is "Keeping On." Good title. Yeah, it's not a retelling of the keepers. It's why I really believe this is why I was born. And I'm not religious. I'm not, but. I think I'm very lucky that I understand why I'm here. Yeah. And I'm 67. And if this is going to be my, you know, legacy, so be it. When I think the Pope probably knows who I am, that's kind of freaky, isn't it? That is uh, (laughs) a bit surreal. Yeah. Yeah. And you got into this because of your connection to Kathy, Sister Kathy. So she inspired you to in your career. So I can see why you why you say that, that you feel like this is kind of your destiny. Um, But I want to add that I don't think you're naive at all. I think you're just a boat rocker, Gemma. Yeah, I am. Causing a ruckus. I'm kind of proud of that. Good. Yeah, good. I am not just a thorn in the side of the archdiocese. I'm like a stake, (laughs) like a plow in the side, because they refuse to admit that reports of abuse were made before 1992. And that's bullshit. Excuse me. Bleep me out. Never. (laughs) Charles Franz, the dentist and the keepers, his mom reported abuse to the archdiocese. She went down there in 1967, and they are claiming that never happened. However, during the Doe Row trial, why in the world would some hotshot and a couple of detectives from the archdiocese come and see him? He wasn't involved in the case. 
and they claim that they came to see him for support and counseling. Well, he wasn't involved in the Doe Row case. They wanted to shut him up in case subpoenas came out. That's so obvious to me. And when he says in the movie, they said, what do you want, a boat? I believe that. He's had yeah. a really rough life. He's not had an easy life. He has had addictions, alcoholism, and the guy keeps plugging away. And he just, he was like our unsung hero in that movie because at the end, when he said, what do I want? I just want you to do the right thing. And they have not done the right thing. So I want to know why they went to see him and what would be the reason for a three hour meeting with him right around the time that the Doe Row case looked like it might be going to trial. Yeah. I mean, that's hard to figure out, is it? Yeah. It's uh, also a little bit suspicious. Do you ever consider, or I'm just curious what your opinion is uh, as you are uncovering all of these details and the scope of the cover up and the conspiracy gets wider and wider and wider when it comes right down to it, there's a there's a a man in a position uh, to intimidate uh, young women. He's he's sexually abusing them, uh, taking advantage of his of of his position uh, of power over them. And and it's not that simple. Then we get into the MK Ultra. We get into uh, the entire like Catholic Church. Do you ever mm-hmm. just uh, is your does it what what's your opinion on that? Like why why is it? Here's my question. Why is it so hard for an organization like the Catholic Church to look at this and say that's that's a bad man? We understand that and we're putting an end to it. Like why does it have to get mm-hmm. to the point where mm-hmm. he's taking? a young woman to see the body of someone he killed and said, that's Mm -hmm. what happens to, how do people not know this about him beforehand? Right. Well, wait, there's a lot of facets to your question. There is. I'm sorry. No, no. The church has been, I wish I had a, a weekly TV show. Believe me, I'd be like, doing this every week on television. Cause I think it's a bigger audience, but CNN hasn't, given me an hour yet so anyway we'll see <laughs> we'll put a gotcha. call into him like between anderson and don lemon my two favorites um okay uh this has been going on since the middle ages this is not something new okay the church has been hiding pedophilia and prostitution and all kind of illegal horrible things since the middle ages And when I think that I'm part of the change, I mean, getting my head wrapped around that I'm a public figure and that I have a voice that people listen to, that is pretty surreal to me. But I, as I said, I think it's why I'm here. So let's say a pedophile priest has a friend who's a cop and he's going to provide girls to the cop. And the cop is going to protect him. The cop is also a pedophile or a rapist. So the priest has an attorney who's a pedophile and they protect each other. It's like a vertical chain. So they all take care of each other. If I believe that Kathy was in a position to take down the whole police force and the whole archdiocese and a whole lot of thugs and part of the mafia in Baltimore. I really do because of what she knew. She was no dummy. She was one of the most intelligent, feisty women I've ever met. And she was 26 years old. Can you imagine that? No. She was collateral damage. Yeah. They had to get rid of her. And I've under, I've heard that Because Maskell threatened girls with death to their families or their boyfriends or themselves, they were terrified. Even Kathy's friend, Russell, who lived with her, I believe she knew what was going on. And when Kathy disappeared and was found murdered, well, I guess she could have been next. So she had to make a decision 
do I save myself and my family or do I tell the truth? What would you do? Man. Tell I, the truth. Yeah. yeah I mean, gotta, the truth is it. always what you should be. Told. I know, yeah. but I, I couldn't. Yeah. I would save my family. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could see it's, right. it's not an easy decision to make. No, but that's, I think that's what it boiled down to. Yeah. Now, right. Maskell, because he had so many arenas, there are all these, if you can picture this huge network of circles, he had thugs who would take money to do anything, pick up girls, uh, provide rooms in back doors at the block, bring men to hotels. He had cops. One girl was tortured and prostituted in a hotel room and told me that she remembers she was she was gagged, but she remembered hearing Maskell say, did you bring the cuffs? And the guy said, they're in the cruiser. I'll go get them. Good so, God. You know, this is like an ongoing chain of 30 cops and they're buddies and they're all taking care of each other. So I heard that there was a group of dads who sort of all got together and were going to go after him, but somehow they were talked out of it. I don't know what happened. Um, I've also talked to the ex-wife of one of the most violent police officers who's dead now. If you read the book, I name him. <laughs> He's in my theory anyway. Um, and she told me that he was abusive to her. And when she called the police, well, guess who shows up? All his friends from the Wilkins district. And they weren't going to do anything. She said they all pulled their, their cars into the driveway and laughed. And then they all left. Just to intimidate? Absolutely. You know, there's so many reasons, but he was a genius. This is like weirder than a James Patterson novel. <laughs> this could be like 16 seasons of The Keepers based on what we've learned. There's so many, so many aspects that we've discovered now. And we're really careful with our research and we check everything out. Abby has pretty much uh, pulled away from the investigation her forte is really research, and so she's doing a yeoman's job of keeping up with the statute of limitations all over the United States and, um, like, the SNAP organization, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests. So she's still doing a lot of the, um, you know, the armchair computer kind of thing. But she also has a family with kids and a husband, and I have Teddy. But I have time. I'm, I'm a widow, and my husband is always my spiritual guide. Um, I shouldn't say this, but even when I'm in another relationship with a new person. But anyway, he's always like there on my shoulder going like, I don't think so. Not this one. But um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but there's so many um, aspects of the whole big hot mess that, I mean, this went way, way up the chain to, to the point where politicians were being brought into that school through the fire door and you know girls are raped on the altar in the chapel yeah, this is it's crazy and disturbing and disgusting um what did uh what happened to uh to masco okay well he's dead i pretty much think he got on the down elevator i don't know unless he had like a change of heart at the end <laughs> yeah he was moved around a lot which is very typical in the archdiocese when yeah. there are reports of abuse to move a priest someplace else and if you and your listeners want to look at the site called bishopsaccountability.org they can look up their state and find their archdiocese and then see all the abuser priests where they served whether they were um, kicked out of the church or laicized. One of the problems is that they're rarely criminally charged. Now, the archdiocese keeps encouraging people to report to the archdiocese if there's clergy abuse, and they have a review board to decide what happens to that clergy person. 
I have been telling people to not do that. My answer is really simple. I say 911. And law enforcement goes and gets that bastard, hauls him into jail, questions them, and the family can charge them with rape. So if the statute of limitations is eliminated, that will be much easier. There is no, I'm, I'm getting into my potty mouth stuff, but there is no damn reason <laughs> for anybody to report this to the church. That's been the yeah. problem all along. So this is why the church doesn't like me, because when I ask them what's, you know, what's the latest, they're like, well, you know, you need to, you're a mandatory reporter, you know, you need to report. I'm like, yeah, I'm not reporting it to you. Why should you have a review board that you've selected? Well, they're all professionals. I don't care. You selected them. What do they have to do with law enforcement? Nothing. So I really discourage people who have um, been abused by a priest, a brother, a nun, um, a, uh, a minister, a rabbi, 911. That's the easiest way to do it. Law enforcement now is not what it was back then. They have to take this seriously. The church certainly isn't. So I would love to I would love to meet with the archdiocese and his attorney and his director of communications, but I doubt they're gonna allow that because if I did, I would insist on, you know, somebody like you guys or a reporter going with me and recording the whole thing. But yeah. that would be my dream to have that meeting. That's not going to happen. And if oh. they're afraid of me, that's fine. I don't care. What are they going to do? Excommunicate me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't want to say I don't have faith. I have faith. I just am totally shattered that I grew up in Catholic school for 12 years and I bought the whole package. Now I feel like it was a facade. Because it's it's all based on guilt, fear, and boredom. Yeah. Yeah. The good priest that I mean, I never really enjoyed going to church or like why should kids go into a dark black box with a man and tell them that they were disrespectful to their parents or that they touched their rear end or that I mean it's crazy. It's not the way God operates. So I, I live on the Atlantic Ocean. That's where I find my higher power. I sit on the beach and I look at the sky every day and I say, you know what? Nobody can explain the sky. It goes on forever. Science can't explain that. It's infinity. So that's pretty big to me. That's a lot. That's powerful to me. So I get my solace and my and my strength from there. And then when I talk to people like you, you know, I get all my uh I get on my soapbox, but that's what you want me to do. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, yeah. So um, I don't even remember. Oh, I don't even remember the. Oh, what happened to Maskell? So he was moved around. Then he was placed when he was kicked out of Keo, or taken out of Keo. He was moved to the Catholic Center, which is the home of the Archdiocese, and that's in downtown Baltimore. And there is an office there called the Division of Schools. Now, a friend of mine used to work there. She said it should have been called Pedophile Central because when they had nowhere else to put these guys, they put them down there. Hmm. So in the five years that Maskell was in the Division of Schools at the Catholic Center, my understanding from the same ex-employee was that he was involved in evaluating children for foster care. What? He was involved in evaluating children for foster care placement. (laughs) So she told me that in the late afternoons and evenings, he would have usually boys, young kids, not toddlers, young kids. He would take them to the movies, to dinner. Nobody does that for poor kids who don't have parents, do they? Right. So here we go with that. Then I heard, I keep saying I heard, but people tell me a lot of stuff and I really try and and get to the bottom of it, that some high school students from a couple of Baltimore high schools were given the opportunity to get like credit 
for like a work study where they would go down to the Catholic center and do filing and clerical work for him. And that those kids left because he was so creepy. Now these were like teenagers who, you know, were probably riding on the bus and stuff to get down there. And he was weird. So I've actually been welcomed onto the alumni pages for those two high schools. And I explain who I am to the administrator and I, post a message that says this is why I'm asking and if you have anything to share let me know I can put you in touch with the attorney general criminal investigator his name's Richard Wolf he's a good guy and he's still taking reports of clergy abuse for a year and a half he's been doing it and he can't tell me much but I send him probably send him somebody every week because a lot of people don't want to like call right away down there and they're like, oh, Gemma knows what to do. She knows everything. Well, I don't know everything, but I'm good at finding it out. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a medical person. I'm not a criminal investigator, although I wish I was. I'm a retired teacher. Who cares? And I'm not a goody two-shoes, obviously, but I really feel like we need to change society. And for me to think that I'm actually part of the change, like how how gratifying is that? I mean, I'm I'm up to my ears and in, in you know bad news, but if I can help somebody find their way out of that, that's why I'm here. So anyway, so Maskell yeah. was there. Then he then there was the cemetery dig, and they dug up all that stuff. And he had a tantrum on the kitchen floor of the rectory at Holy Cross, which is where the cemetery dig was. And one of his buddy priests took him out and took him to his parish where they hid him for a while. That was Father Hawkins down at, I think it was St. Rose and someplace in Dundalk. And then... um. He was given the opportunity to either go into a psychiatric hospital or I don't know what the other option was. And they said, he said, what should I do? And the bishop said, go. Well, he was there six months. They said he was fine. He came back. He wasn't fine. Uh, right. So, he, yeah, he took off for Ireland. Pedophilia can't be cured. It is a it's a crime. It's also a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And that, that's hard for people to understand that a mental illness can be a crime. But if acted on, it's a crime. He takes off for Ireland. And no, I think the church paid for him to get there. I don't know. So he sets up a counseling um, practice in Wexford, Ireland, where he's counseling abused children. Nobody knew who this guy was until he requested to join like some monks or priesthood and they had to get a reference and they found out from Baltimore who he was, but there's no extradition between the United States and Ireland. So there's nothing that the church could do. They probably didn't want him to come back, but he came back and he ended up at um, St. Augustine in the area called Elkridge, which is not far from Lansdowne. And he was there for a couple of years. Um, he had a stroke, very young, which I think is really suspicious. Like, how does that happen? Hmm. And he uh, was moved to a nursing home and then caught pneumonia and died and actually in the hospital where Christian Richter did all the illegal abortions. Um, so that is what happened to him. He was never formally charged with anything as well, right? Never, 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 never. So never, that's nothing. so crazy. This, yeah, this is a problem because, okay, let's say Father Joe, I don't even want to use the name. Let's say Father Joe, because that was Maskell's Joseph is um, accused of abuse and it's a credible accusation okay so the church can question the people that are uh, 
accusing him. And if they think it's credible, they can do two things. They can remove his faculties, which means he can't be a priest. He's still a priest, but he can't do the sacraments. He can't say mass. He can't hear confessions, which I think is kind of stupid because if you have your faculties removed, it doesn't mean that you have your, you know, what removed. He's still a pedophile. Right. If he's focused on pedophilia every day, which I think he was, like, he doesn't care if he can say mass or not. It doesn't mean anything to him. So that's the first option they have. The second option they have is to lay a size L-A-I-C-I-Z-E, the priest, and that has to happen from the Pope. Only the Pope can make a priest not a priest. Now, what happens then is that the onus is off the church. They've gotten rid of him. And where does the responsibility fall on the community? So any priests who have been laicized or had their faculties removed are living in luxury retirement homes on the church's dime around the Baltimore Beltway. And I can name the priests and where they live because that's what I've been looking at. And as unregistered sex offenders. Now, my mom lived in a beautiful retirement community called Charlestown until she was died at 94. Very happy years there. But let's say this nice man moves in down the hall and we find out that he used to be father something something and that he was credibly abused, accused and is on the bishop's accountability list. Do I want him living on the hall where we're taking my grandchildren and my um, the toddlers in the family to see my mom? Of course not. So my thing with the church this month is how can you do that? Now, the director of communications, his name is Sean Kane, C-I-A-N-E. I would love for some of your listeners to write to him. S. Kane at archvault.org and he told us on a podcast he said well if home depot fires somebody they don't keep track of where they live <laughs> okay and there was, there was silence come on shane did this podcast by himself i was listening on mute because i knew i couldn't keep my temper and i don't think kane would have done it if he had known i was going to be part of it they don't like me but anyway he said yeah if, if home depot or lowe's fires somebody they don't keep track of where they are i'm speechless on that one well why it's it's comparable yeah it's really yeah. comparable i mean you don't want somebody you know they're, they're not going to go out and uh recklessly uh do home improvements exactly but yet they're still collecting their pensions and they are getting still some are, if they're still priests, they're getting their stipends, they're getting their salaries and the church is paying for where they live. And some of those places are thousands of dollars a month. Well, that is that is truly infuriating. And we could probably talk to you for another another uh, hour. On I this. know. Uh, I know. I just yeah. kind of rambled on. and on. No, no, I? that was not rambling. No, whatsoever. no, it was amazing. There's so much going on here. Yeah. If you want to have me back, if you want to ask your listeners to send questions to you, and then I can answer questions, too, if you want. The more I talk about this, the more people understand. Like, I, I hope that you have some takeaways from this that maybe you weren't aware of before. Uh, many. Absolutely. Many takeaways. Yeah. That's a good idea about having the listeners send some questions, and we definitely want to have you on again uh, to answer okay. those. And I think in the meantime, if anybody... Uh, is uh, fascinated and captivated by this and they want something beyond the keepers. Uh, the podcast mm -hmm. that you do with Shane Waters is outstanding right. out of the shadows. They should listen to that. You said yes. you have over 40 and, episodes and you're always right. uh, releasing new information. Mm -hmm. Every week. And um, actually we're having three episodes coming up. We have a federally trained behavior detection analyst and we are going to watch three interviews from the keepers one is with jerry coob kathy's quote boyfriend 
One is with Edgar Davidson, the guy that we think was involved in her murder. And one is Sharon May, the district attorney. And this guy has looked at all three of those interviews and is going to do a play-by-play with us and our listeners about what he is seeing in terms of their facial um, expressions, their hands, the way they move their bodies, their eyes. It's going to be fascinating. Yeah. But you can find us on any podcast platform like Himalaya, Spotify. I don't know what you guys, what what ones do you use? All of them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're on all of them. The other thing that listeners can do is they can go to Out of the Shadows Discussion Group. And what we do is once we release the podcast, then we invite everybody to talk about it the day after it's released. And that gets very um, that gets very animated. We are really um, tight about inappropriate comments because we've all been trashed and trolled. I'm sure you understand that people don't like everything I'm saying. And they've accused me of everything from obstruction of justice to absconding with money none of which is true, but we like people to disagree. But as soon as somebody goes for a personal attack, they're gone. They don't even get a second chance. Love that. Listeners would have to answer a couple questions. And because of all the trolls that are around, we do look at backgrounds and Facebook pages. And if they make up a Facebook page, we've gotten really good at telling that it's not a real person. So, um, yeah, we're trying to build in a lot of security for ourselves and the people that we're interviewing. But I I really want to thank you guys for doing this today because, you know, the more information that gets out there, the closer we will get to answers.